Well, it looks like we've got um, the majority of people here listening, so I will go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Maya Swope and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We're really excited to have you joining us here this afternoon um, to learn about wilderness survival skills and what you need to know to stay safe on your Boundary Waters trip. Um, here at Friends of the Boundary Waters, we've been working to protect the BWCA and the Quetico Superior ecosystem for more than 40 years. And we really do that because of all of you and through all of your support. So thank you for watching and for supporting our work. And that really is what keeps us going um, and working to protect the Boundary Waters. Um, we divide our mission and our work into three categories. We think of wilderness, people, and community. So for wilderness, we are really working to prevent copper sulfide mining in the Boundary Waters. You may have heard of the Twin Metals and Polymet Mines, and together these mines really present a single threat to the wilderness. And so we're working hard to stop that through legislative action, through the courts, and through citizen action. We also are focused on people. Um, so a big part of that is bringing underrepresented kids into the Boundary Waters through our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program. Right now that's um, mostly virtual, um, but we're working um, this summer to, to bring some more kids up north as well. And then finally, we have our communities part of our mission, and that's really recognizing that strong northern communities at the gateway to the Boundary Waters are really key to keeping the Boundary Waters protected and keeping those communities strong and healthy. Um, so we're really grateful to have you join us here today. Um, I'm excited to introduce our presenter. J.R. Hunt is a wilderness EMT. Um, he is an instructor for REI's outdoor school and just has a lot of search and rescue and wilderness medicine experience. Um, he also has been running COVID vaccination clinics um, over the past few months, and so we're really grateful that he's able to take a break from that today to join us this afternoon. Um, a few housekeeping notes. There is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, so if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, um, you can add those to the Q&A feature there. There's also a chat button, so if you have more technical questions, um, you can chat to me using that, and I'll also be posting a few links there throughout the presentation. Um, so I think that's it for the housekeeping stuff. We're really excited to have you here, um, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Maya. Uh, welcome all uh, to the lunch. I hope you have a good lunch planned. Um, also, we're going to have some good information, so please, uh, if you have questions, uh, fire them off. We'll be sure to answer them at the end. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about three specific things. We're going to talk and we're going to dive deep into these. Uh, the rule of threes, uh, top three reasons for search and, uh, that we're finding as a canine search and rescue, part of a canine search and rescue team for uh, search and rescues, and uh, the 10 essentials. What are they and why? So among wilderness survival tips, pinching a wild animal in the face probably isn't your bet. It shouldn't be on your checklist. It's not uh, the best idea, and I thought I'd start with that. This is a good tip. So let's talk a little bit about the rule of threes. So the rule of threes goes something like this in a survival situation. You can survive without air or an icy water for three minutes. You can survive without shelter or in a harsh environment for three hours. You can survive without water for three days. And you can survive without food for three weeks. So of all those, other than breathing, I mean, you all have to breathe, the most important, according to this list, would be, here's a hint if you didn't know, it's shelter. Shelter is a place, here a second. Giving temporary sh uh, protection from bad weather or danger, according to the dictionary. So whatever your definition of shelter, Make sure you're protected from the elements. Build a shelter based on how long you think you might be there. You, ne you never know how long you're going to be in the woods. Give your best guess. Um, up in the boundary waters, 
Uh, there's folks in St. Louis County search, uh, search and Rescue do a really good job of uh, uh, being active as soon as uh, a call happens. And uh, they're, they're very well trained. Um, so typically, you're not going to find yourself in the woods for longer than a couple of days, hopefully. Um, but uh, just know that uh, build your shelter based on, you know, as long as you're protected from the elements and, and you build a solid shelter, you should be okay. Um, as far as things like uh, uh, get, getting found in, in time and, and protecting yourself from the elements. Um, when you're making your shelter, the three most important factors when selecting a spot would be location. Uh, look up, down, around. Make sure there are no widow makers if you've ever heard that term before. Those would be the branches that are about to fall and haven't quite fallen yet. You don't know when there's going to be a storm and could come down on your camp. Um, Try to have access to food and water sources. You don't want to be too close to a water source um, because there's animals using those water sources as well. Um, so keep that in mind when you're uh, when you're building your shelter and you're selecting a spot for your shelter. Um, try to have a clearing nearby. Uh, signal fires, things like that, uh, can be really helpful in uh, teams finding you, especially when they're flying overhead looking for you. And a lot of times when you are lost in the boundary waters, uh, there will be not just teams on the field, but there will be folks in the air, either fixed ring or rotary, rotary wing, uh, looking for you at the same time. Um, just a uh, note here, when I say look up, down, and around, if you look at this picture on the right, I don't know if you notice this, but under, underneath, there's, uh, there's um, rocks and there's a clearing there. Chances are water's been running under there, so make sure you're not setting your tent up or setting up your emergency shelter someplace where, wa where water travels. Uh, nothing worse than being cold and wet at night. So top three reasons for a search and rescue call out. Typically for us, the most common ones are injury, illness, uh, lost, or a member of the party's lost. And environmental and uh, we're going to dive in each one of these. First of all, uh, mobilizing injury. Injuries where you where you can't uh, you can't get safely out under your own power. Uh, typically those are things like a mechanical injury to your leg or arm if you're paddling. Um, and then there's also medical emergencies. Injuries to things like your humerus which is in your arm. The upper part of your arm, uh, femur, which is in your which is in your leg, uh, tibia, fibia, uh, they all require stabilization. Uh, these are injuries where you, you're almost always going to be immediately back. You're going to want to immediately evac. Um, if anything that requires stabilization, you shouldn't do. You shouldn't do any activity with an injury like that. Uh, spinal, uh, humerus, and femur. Are, the, are all immediate evac injuries. So make sure if you have any fractures or any of those types of things to those areas that uh, first of all, you stabilize them and then, uh, and then you, uh, you get out however safely you can do that. Um, make sure when you're immobilizing an injury, you immobilize the joint above and the joint below and leave an area for uh, to be able to check, check to make sure that you're not losing blood flow from that area that you've immobilized. Um, most common ways to check, if you know how to check a pulse, you can check a pulse on your wrist, you can check a pulse on the top of your foot. Um, also, uh, your nail beds. You look at the, your fingers, if you squeeze your finger and let go, it turns from white to pink, and that's how you check for, uh, for uh, blood flow to distal areas. Uh, those are, that's the easiest way if you're, if you're not comfortable taking a pulse or you're not able to uh, find one. Um, if you're with a group, it's okay to safely move and transport if you can. Um, if, you, if something's immobilized and you've done a good job immobilizing that, that particular area that's been injured, then please, uh, if you think you can get out safely, 
uh, go ahead and do so. But make sure that you leave areas open where you can check to make sure that that particular person or yourself uh, have a lost blood flow to those extremities. Uh, that's typically a telltale sign that you, uh, your your splint or your is either too tight, or uh, or you need to readjust your splint to make sure that you've got blood flow back to those areas. Um, this is not designed to be a medical first aid class. Um, if you're looking for more details, please uh, please take one. Uh, it gives you some valuable information. Uh, what do you do? Well, you're going to want to stabilize that injury, splint or sling. If you're with a party, uh, get help. Um, it's okay to leave that person where they are if you can't move them and, uh, and go get help. Uh, if you have a PLB, a uh, personal locator beacon, and you're not able to transport, don't be afraid to activate it. And uh, we can talk about personal locator beacons a little bit later. Um, those would be things like your spot or your Garmin inReach mini, or even if you have a sat phone. Uh, don't plan on having cell phone service in the boundary waters, spotty coverage. So um, it's not the worst idea to have one. Uh, depending on the condition, it may necessitate a, a need, it, there might be a need for you to split up um, to get help. And, and, you know, sometimes that's okay. As long as you uh, don't send the person that, uh, that is the best with wilderness medicine uh, to go do that, to go get help. Um, sometimes they are required at, on scene. Uh, don't, but don't be afraid to activate SAR if you need, if you need it. Here's an example of a leg injury. Uh, Typically, folks that have uh, an injury to their leg uh, aren't able to get out. <laughs> As you can see, it may, it, this is going to make it really tough for somebody to walk. So this is a good example of a, of a lower extremity injury that uh, requires splinting. And you can see that I used a, a pad there. Uh, there's a sleeping pad and then uh, stuffed it to make sure it's padded. Uh, make sure that you use a really good amount of padding on this because uh, there's potential for it to get banged up out there. And then you have to hold it in place. We used a couple cravats. If you carry, and you should carry, a bandana, then you're, you can certainly, if you can get it around there, tie it up, cut it in strips and, and tie it around. Um, in this case, we used an ace bandage. It's not the worst idea to carry an ace bandage with you um, as part of your first aid kit just so you can help uh, stabilize those types of injuries. Here's an arm splint. This could be shoulder. This could be, this could be uh, elbow. This could be forearm. So things like your radius and ulna. Um, you can make sure that uh, it's immobilized. As you can see, we not only splinted it, but we slinged it. And slinging it's important because you don't want to be able to move it around. You want to bang it around. So this is a, this is a real good way to, uh, to, to immobilize it and make sure that, uh, that it's not moving around. The, if, if you've got a broken bone, the last thing you want to do is start moving those bones around because they, they rub against each other. You could hear some grinding, uh, also known as crepitus, um, and, and that's a bad thing. Also, that bone has a ten, uh, can, can potential to move and cut off that circulation. Uh, this one is kind of hard to see, but if it, at the top there, their fingers are out. So you're able to, once again, monitor those distal pulses uh, or at least check for blood circulation to make sure. So can these things be prevented? Well, so, sometimes they can. Uh, sometimes you, you just fall and hurt yourself and it just happens. Um, some of the things you can do to mitigate some of these, uh, act, some of these injuries, uh, be in appropriate shape for the level of activity. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew. This is uh, one of those situations out here where you're, where you're out in the woods 
and uh, maybe you're paddling and you're like, well, let's get to the next campsite. Well, how far is the next campsite? Is there potential for injury because you're tired? Don't forget to stretch. Uh, it's, it's, it's a funny thing to say when you're out there, but you've been paddling all day and then you go to sleep on the ground and then you get up and, and you, could, you could be a little bit uh, stiff. So don't forget to do some arm circles, uh, squats, uh, move your wrists around, those types of things. Don't forget to stretch. And walk deliberately. Um, walking deliberately, know where your foot is before you pick up your other foot. Um, this is a real common, uh, common place to, uh, to get injured, is stepping out of the canoe and slipping and falling. Um, we've, we've had calls where folks have gotten out of their canoe, stepped on a slippery rock and, and hit their head or twisted their ankle or twisted their knees, uh, knee. It's, it's not uncommon to do those types of things when you're out there. So make sure when you're stepping out of that canoe that you, uh, that you step deliberately, know where you're, st what you're stepping onto before you step, uh, make smart choices. Some other injuries or illnesses in this case would be things like a heart condition. If you have a member of your party that has a heart condition, uh, not a bad idea to carry a low dose aspirin. Uh, if they have a history of arrhythmia or something along those lines, uh, or a previous heart condition or current heart condition, it's not a bad idea to carry a low dose aspirin. It could save that person's life. Um, baby aspirin is the most common comes in small bottles so it doesn't take up a lot of space although you have a fair amount of space when you're when you're paddling you have a, you have room those uh those portage packs are pretty good size so you could carry a little bit larger uh, uh kit first aid kit than you would normally carry um maybe if you have allergies that person has an allergy that they require an epi pen keep those things in mind um Communicate to, to the, all the members of the team if you're going with a group uh, and, and make sure they know how to use the EpiPen. Uh, diabetic, this is another one that we get a call for, calls for if, on, from time to time. Uh, diabetic emergencies, uh, type one diabetics specifically, the folks that require insulin on a regular basis. Uh, Pick, pick a member of your party that isn't squeamish to be able to, to do a blood sugar check or uh, to deliver some insulin if, uh, if they need to, if the, the diabetic isn't able to check their own blood sugar. Uh, it's a, not an idea to, it's not a bad idea to also know the signs and symptoms. Make sure the members of your party know those signs and symptoms to mitigate that because sometimes when you're diabetic, you don't always, you're, you're not always uh, in the right frame of mind to be able to remember, okay, I got to check my blood sugar. I got to, I got to, you know, if, if you're past that point, have somebody else in the party or other members of the party know what those, what those signs and symptoms are. If you're of having too much, too high a blood sugar, or too low a blood sugar. Uh, make smart choices. Things like cutting and carving. Don't do that stuff on your leg. We've been called for those things before. It is not funny. Uh, <laughs> if you're cutting on your leg, there's a really large artery that runs in your leg called the femoral artery that uh, you can bleed out from that. So make, make some smart choices there. Uh, cutting or carving, don't do it on your leg. Don't, uh, pouring coffee, we see this one from time to time as well. Your member of the party's holding a coffee cup and the other person's pouring into that coffee cup. Hot water goes onto your hand. And uh, now you've got a burn, potentially a second degree burn, second or third degree. So make smart choices when you're doing some of these activities. So let's move on to the, the next one, which is lost or a member of the party lost. You or a member of your party lose bearings or become lost in the back country, or uh, you or a member of your party unknown location. You don't know where they are. They wandered off for firing, firewood and they haven't been back in an hour. So what do you do? Well, 
you should all be carrying whistles. A whistle can, can the sound of a whistle can carry up to a mile. So it, it's really important that you're able to signal. It carries a lot further than your voice does. So make sure that you're carrying a whistle. They don't weigh much. You can put it around your neck and carry it all the time. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a bad idea to have one. Uh, go to a rally point. Pick a rally point. We're going to meet here at this particular time. If, I don't, if I'm not there 30 minutes after that time, start signaling. Start making some types of signals. And trust your trip itinerary. Hopefully, all of you are creating trip itineraries and leaving it with at least five people that you trust to let them know when you're going in, when you're coming out, what campsites you're planning on using, the route you're going, and phone numbers. Uh, St. Louis County is a real good number to have. Those, those search and rescue folks are really good out there. Uh, they, they, they respond quickly and they're very efficient and they're very well trained. So trust your trip itinerary out there. Um, I like to keep I, I like to keep one on the on the dash of my car. Um, in the military, we called it LKP, last known point. And as a civilian, it's point of last contact, so PLC. Um, though, as a search and rescue person, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the PLC. I'm going to find out what the inf the information I need to know, and then I'm going to start from there and work my way. And always carry 10 essentials. And we'll cover that a little bit later, but we're going to talk about what those 10 essentials are. Even when I'm wandering off from the group, I throw on a quick day pack and throw my, throw my 10 essentials in there that, that, that in, in the case that I need it. You, you never know when you're going to need something like that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. You create, and it's really important, the trip itinerary. I can't put enough information about that. Um, I also keep uh, on my watch a little road ID. Uh, that way, the uh, search and rescue folks can go to that, go to the website. They can see who you are. Do you have any medical conditions? Things like that. So it's not a bad idea to have one. Can it be prevented? So if you're in a group, don't split up unless you have to. Now, when I say split up, I mean don't go to another campsite unless you have to. Um, if you're going to get firewood or something like that, and those are common things folks get lost doing. Uh, it's easy to get turned around when you get into the woods. Uh, don't, split, don't go far if you're getting firewood. You shouldn't have a problem finding any. There's, there's ample dead standing timber out uh, around campsites these days that you don't have to go very far to get some decent firewood. Um, it's not necessary to have a Texas A&M fire out there. Uh, so keep that in mind too for leave no trace principles. Uh, mark your location on a map or GPS. If you have a GPS and a map with you and you really should have at least a map and compass, mark your, mark your location on your GPS so you can, you can set that waypoint and you're able to do a reverse back to that waypoint so you can get yourself back. Or if you use a map to go find firewood and you, you mark the location, don't be afraid to use that reverse azimuth on your, on your compass to uh, find your way back. So the last part is environmental. Uh, incoming storms, rain, lightning, or gear damage, brand repair, or things like that. Here's an example of uh, some weather coming in. The uh, one in the middle is called Virga. That's when the rain columns come down. You can kind of see that there. Uh, there's some lightning there. This, is, uh, this can be a dangerous situation if you're in the back country. There's very little places to hide. So what do you do? Well, if you're ever stuck in a situation where there's going to be a storm and you just can't paddle your way out, you really shouldn't if the lightning. Everybody knows how to count. How far, light, how far away lightning is. It's the difference between the noise and the light. And that's measured in miles. Uh, avoid sheltering near dead standing timber. Dead standing timber tends to come down relatively easily when there's a high wind. So please be careful with that. Uh, if you see lightning, try not to shelter near, near 
uh, near trees. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit tougher to do, but uh, try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, if there is lightning above you, crouch down low. Stay low. You want to be shorter, lower than anything else above you. Um, and stand on a foam pad. Just ride it out. Uh, try not to huddle together. Uh, it, it's, it's a common thing that you want to do because it's, it makes you feel better and you get some warmth from that. But uh, it's, it's more chance for everybody to get hurt. And then activate your personal locator beacon if you think you need to do it. There's not typically a ton that can be done. Uh, a lot of times, search and rescue teams protect themselves first. And so you might not find a lot of teams coming out to find you. But if the storm's far enough away and they're able to get to you safely, they typically will. Um, winds out of the south. That's another telltale sign. Uh, there could, could be danger coming. Uh, cumulus clouds. Uh, we talked about Virga are all good warning signs that uh, the weather's coming. And then uh, only try to paddle out if the lightning is more than 10 minutes away. And that'd be flash to thunder. So can it be prevented? With some planning, with advanced planning, typically it can be. Um, obviously, you know, the weather reports aren't always 100% accurate. We all know that. But you can go to places and get ideas on weather trends and things like that. Uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is a great place to go to get some good information on what type of weather is coming in or could potentially be coming in uh, based on when you're going and uh, the time of year. Uh, weather Prediction Center and uh, the geostationary operational environmental satellite uh, graphs show really good information on places to uh, on times that uh, could potentially have more storms or, or storms could be coming in so know those sites do your research uh, that should rel keep you relatively safe So let's talk about the 10 essentials. So I've grouped the 10 essentials into categories. And so we'll cover each category. I'll give you a little bit of information about what I carry, but know that your results could vary. These are my 10 essentials. It doesn't have to be a lot. Uh, it doesn't have to be a large pack full of gear. These are things that I would carry if I was in an emergency. I can rely on most of these items to uh, keep me relatively safe. First of all, it's, it's really important to know how to use all of these items. Um, don't go out there with an item that you don't know how to use. Uh, things like uh, knives and stuff like that. And we'll talk about those. We're gonna go in each category in detail. Navigation's the first, camp, first category. I always carry a map, I carry a compass, I carry a waterproof notebook, and I carry a pencil. And the reason I carry a pencil is I can just sharpen that easily. I don't have to worry about a pen. Um, and I, I carry one that I get from the golf course. It's only about yay long, so it doesn't take up a lot of space and it weighs almost nothing. The maps, I'll print those in advance. I'll print them on, I print them on right in the rain paper because it's waterproof. Uh, unfortunately, it requires that you use a laser printer to do that, but uh, I know that if it gets wet, I'm not going to lose important details that I need to be aware of on the map. I carry a compass. I always carry a compass. And know how to use them. That's the most important part. Know how to use these tools. Uh, if you don't know how to use a map and compass, please, please, please take a map and compass class. Just even a basic class can get you uh, out of trouble could get you into trouble too, but that's a whole other story. Uh, waterproof notebook. I carry a waterproof notebook. Sometimes I like to make notes of the directions of travel, um, time of day. Uh, sometimes it, it calms me to make notes if I'm lost and to journal a little bit. And uh, we talked about why I carry a pencil. 
illumination. This doesn't have to be a big operation. I carry a simple little flashlight that I got that's super bright and I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, it getting hurt because it's waterproof. I also carry a light stick. And the reason I carry a light stick is so I can signal at night if you hear any, uh, any overhead, anything coming overhead, like uh, fixed wing or rotary wing, uh, airplanes, helicopters. Um, I can tie it to a piece of paracord and swing it around and it, 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 it's, it's visible from a distance. So I always carry a light stick with me. Um, and then you, can, you could certainly carry a headlamp, but if you carry a headlamp, Make sure you carry spare batteries. First aid. This is the extent of my first aid kit in my uh, 10 Essentials container. I use a Nalgene to keep anything, everything together. Uh, but if you need to carry more than this, um, you shouldn't need to carry more than this is my point. Uh, I always carry a pair of gloves. Uh, if you're treating somebody or yourself, you want to make sure that area stays as clean as possible. So gloves are a good way to do that. Uh, Band-aids. I carry a couple, four or five Band-aids. Uh, ba I carry one large Band-aid in case I need to uh, cover a larger area. I carry ibuprofen, Tylenol, aspirin. I'm an ibuprofen person. Tylenol doesn't work for me. Your results may vary carry what works for you. I carry the aspirin in case of a heart condition. Uh, wound closer strips, those are those little zip, the little mini strips that you use. Uh, they usually, they work really well to uh, close an open wound. And then I will put uh, the large Band-Aid over the top of that to keep it clean. I carry petroleum jelly. I do that for a couple different reasons. Uh, one, I can use it on my lips. Uh, for, for chapstick. I can use it uh, to help start a fire and I can use it to keep a wound moist. So I don't carry a non-adherent bandage, uh, meaning the bandage could potentially stick. And so I'll, sometimes I'll put some petroleum jelly around the area, not in the wound, but around the area just to make sure that the bandage doesn't stick to it. And I was carried Ziploc bag. Uh, I can use that for a multitude of reasons, plus it keeps my first aid kit dry. I also carry a bandana and that can be used. And I always carry a bright color, uh, never like a green or a black or a dark blue. I, just carry, I, I think I carry a pink one. My daughter gave it to me and I carry it and I throw it in there. Um, it's from her, so it helps me stay a little close to home sometimes when I'm traveling alone. But uh, I carry it because it's easy to spot. I don't have the potential to lose it. Um, one other thing I carry sometimes is the, uh, which I carry is the antibiotic ointment. It's not sometimes I was carrying, but I, I don't pack triple antibiotic ointment because some people have allergies to one of the antibiotics in a triple antibiotic ointment. So I tend not to carry triple antibiotic. Just a note. I carry a multi-tool. I carry a multi-tool in my emergency kit. Uh, because I, it has a knife on it, but it also has tool. It also has uh, uh, repairs. I, it's got it's got a, a rent, um, uh, pliers on it, so I can do some repairs to gear if I need to. But I always, when I'm in the woods, I typically carry a fixed blade knife. Um, this one is one that I carry often. Um, it doesn't have. If you're not comfortable carrying a fixed blade knife, don't do it for the first time. Uh, there's way more potential for injury with a knife like this when I, you're doing, if you're doing things like carving or chopping or splitting wood and things like that. Um, you can still sh cut yourself with any knife, but uh, don't take anything you don't know how to use. So be comfortable with your multi-tool. Know what it has. Know what it hasn't, what it doesn't have on it, and uh, you'll know how to... Uh, you'll know how to be comfortable using it. Fire. Fire is important. You would be surprised how, mu how much of an increase in your feeling of well-being happens when you light a fire. Uh, we all in Minnesota, uh, 
could be nationally. I don't, I don't have any evidence of that. Love to sit around the fire, uh, have a couple cold pops, barley, whatever you drink, and, uh, and sit around a fire and, and, and just stare at it. And that warmth that comes off of that uh, makes a huge difference. Um, so I carry a couple different ways to start a fire with this. Uh, I carry windproof, waterproof matches in a case. I carry a Bic lighter. Bic lighter is great to have, and I carry a small one so it doesn't take up a ton of space. I also carry a solid fuel tab. Uh, those are the Esbit tabs that you can buy online at Amazon or at REI. You can split them into four sections, and they're primarily used for cooking. But if you have a lot of wet wood around you, they're really great to help get that fire going. And I carry lip balm. Lip balm is great to help start a fire. You can put it on things and, and a lot of times it'll help, help you get that fire going. Some of the other things you can carry are things like petroleum jelly, cotton balls, uh, dryer lint. Um, and uh, it, sometimes you can find things in the, in the woods in the back country that help you uh, get that fire going. Um, I'm seeing this increasingly more as I spend time out in the woods, but please don't strip trees uh, any more than you need to uh, light a fire. Um, we're, I'm starting to see more and more, especially things like paper, birch, bark trees, stripped down right to the wood and it just kills the trees. So please uh, leave no trace, but start your fire. Shelter. All I carry for shelter is a space blanket and 25 and about 25 feet or 550 cord. It's all I need. You can do a lot of things with this. Uh, I taught a class. Uh, I, I did a primer with my search and rescue team on uh, starting a fire. Uh, different topics within uh, wilderness survival in the backcountry. And uh, I built a shelter with just the items that were out there and a, and a rescue blanket. And these blankets are cheap and you can get them in really nice big sizes. You can buy them in small little packs. They're really hard to get back into the pack. Don't bother trying. Um, Amazon sells them for, I don't know, $2 or something like that. So you can find them pretty inexpensively. And uh, they throw off, they reflect a ton of heat. It's amazing what the difference in temperature is, and they take up almost no space and weigh almost nothing. 25 feet of cord, I always carry 25 feet of cord. Uh, I, it's handy for a multitude of uses from a, a clothesline to, uh, to stripping it out and using the individual threads. Uh, you can do lots of, you can sew with them uh, with the individual threads. There's, there's a multitude of uses, and I always carry a bright color. I never carry a color that's dark because at night, I, I don't want to clothesline myself with that. Here's an example of a shelter that I made during a wilderness survival class uh, with my search and rescue team. I, it took me a matter of, I don't know, something like 35, 40 minutes. It required very minimal effort, very little energy was expended to build this, and it was mostly supplies at hand. So you can see, I've got a space blanket on the back of that, and that throws off a ton of heat. You will be surprised how much, how much uh, different it feels inside there. Uh, there's plenty of dead standing timber around too. You don't need to kill trees to build a shelter. We're not building a cabin, this is an emergency shelter. Food, I carry, I keep it pretty simple. I carry an energy bar. I can chop it up into sections and eat it a little bit at a time. I carry beef jerky and I carry candy. If anybody's ever been in the woods with me, they know that I love my gummy bears. I love them. I eat them all the time. It's quick energy. Uh, it gets me through the day. Um, and it, it, I, I, it's just, it's my comfort food. This is what I carry with me. I get it in a small package and I can put it inside my, my, uh, my kit and I don't have to worry about, uh, I don't have to worry about not having my gummy bears because I got to have them. I also like to take bullion cubes. Just simple little bullion cubes. Boil them in some water and I get uh, salt and I get a hot drink. So this is kind of nice to carry. 
weighs nothing, uh, and and it uh, it's it's really nice sometimes to have a hot drink. Clothing and sun protection. I carry a buff. I carry a beanie, and I carry a tall kitchen garbage bag. Those are the things that I carry in my emergency kit. And what you're probably wondering. Well, why would you put the garbage bag in there? Well, because they make great ponchos. <laughs> if you're getting wet, punch a hole through the head for your head, couple for your arms, and throw it on you. And I always carry a white one, never a black one. That way I'm easy to spot. Uh, it's better to pack, wear light layers rather than rather than a lot of thick layers, unless it's winter time. That's different. Uh, I carry wool and fleece. I never carry cotton. In my opinion, cotton kills. Uh, it hangs on to moisture. It saps away your, your body heat through a process called conduction. It is, uh, in my opinion, I, I, don't, I don't carry cotton out in the woods. And it just makes you feel clammy. It hangs on to your moisture. Water purification. Now this one's important. Don't ever assume water is safe because water is not safe. I carry, you can't assume it. GR, things like Giardia and Cryptosporidium are just nasty, nasty bugs to have. And if you're already in a survival situation, you don't want to get, you don't want to have diarrhea as well. Granted, Giardia uh, takes a pro, something between seven to 10 days before your first onset of symptoms. But I'd, I'd, I'd rather treat my, treat my water. Uh, some people boil, and that's fine too. You can certainly boil your water. You can filter. I find filters tend to be a little bit larger, so I don't typically carry them. Some people even carry, some people even carry small bottles of bleach. And you can treat your water with bleach in a short term only. Bleach in a long term is very, very uncomfortable. Uh, and it's very hard on your system. So uh, I, would, I would just as soon carry a bottle of potable aqua. It comes in a bottle about yay big. There's 50 pills in there, treats a quart of water or something like that each. It's, 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 really, uh, it's, it's really safer for me to carry. Don't, moral of the story is don't dehydrate in the backcountry. And everything fits into my Nalgene. Well, almost. My compass doesn't quite fit into my Nalgene, but it's got a short enough cord. I can put it around, screw on the top, and it stays on there. But uh, the, your 10 Essentials kit, in short, doesn't have to be a big, it doesn't have to be a huge kit. It doesn't require a big bag. It all fits inside your Nalgene, and, and, and it's easy to transport, easy to throw in a day pack, and you're good. Granted, you have a lot of room in a, in a, in a, in a canoe, when you're paddling in the boundary waters, but that's not always the case. A uh, little story, a uh, gentleman in the woods, he has lost, he lost his direction, which is easy to do by the way. It's easy to be uh, temporary dis temporarily displaced. So he thought he could uh, cover more ground by taking his pack off and then go to find the trail and then come back and get his pack. It's found a couple days later without his pack, cold, wet, alive, but uh, we never, we, his pack was never found. So just know that uh, make smart choices when you're out there. Uh, don't leave anything behind, especially if you think you're going to separate. Don't panic. Don't panic. With some planning and some, uh, some forethought and make smart choices, you, uh, you'll, you'll be safe out there and you'll have a good time. Chance favors the prepare mind. I, I like this saying for a myriad of reasons because if you are prepared, you've created that trip itinerary, you've got your 10 essentials, you've got, uh, you know how to use all your equipment, you're, you've got much, your chances are very much improved if, if you do get lost in the woods. My time is up. I have time for questions. Maya, I'm going to uh, 
you want to fire off some questions for me. Yeah, so I'll jump in here. Um, we've got a lot of really good questions in the chat. One kind of overall note, a few people are asking if this is recorded. Um, yeah, we are recording this session and I can send that out to everybody um, tomorrow. Um, we'll have it, a link to our YouTube page um, where we'll have this recording. Um, so I will just kind of poke through some of these questions. I guess I'll start off with um, sort of a different one, but someone is wondering if you have ever had to be rescued or um, if there's a, an interesting or scary situation that you are willing to tell us about um, that could be informative of maybe what not to do or, or what you did in a situation like that. Sure. Um, I have to think about that one. I was on, I was in Badlands National Park. I did a solo trip from Canada Canyon to Pine Ridge Reservation and back. Um, and I wasn't really prepared for how hot it was going to be. I went in July and, uh, I didn't pack enough water. And for those of you that know Badlands National Park, there is, uh, there's no potable water in bat in the Badlands. You can't filter it. There's nothing there that's safe to drink. Um, so there was a bunch of poor choices that were made on my part, primarily time of year and planning. Um, that I ended up not, well, uh, kind of getting rescued. <laughs> there were some people that happened to come through and uh, they got me to some definitive care, um, obviously dehydrated and, and things like that. But uh, it, it comes down to planning. I thought I had enough water. I had placed my water caches in, in lo specific locations on my way down. So on my way back, I would know where they were and then the batteries died on my GPS and I couldn't find my spares. So all those points that I had marked where I'd stashed my water, I, I, I don't know where the water was. So, you know, it's one of those things where we're relying on technology and that brings up a really good point. You know, a lot of us have these watches, you know, Apple watches, Fitbit, whatever it is that you're using. Remember, you have to charge these things. So when I'm going in the back country now, I stop using my Apple Watch. I just carry my regular watch because I can do a lot of things with it, not just tell time. I can use it as a makeshift compass, things like that. And there's really good YouTube videos about that you can do. Um, but relying on technology is a double-edged sword. Um, there, there's a lot of great things out there. There's, a really, there's some really great tech out there. But uh, you kind of you have to be careful with that kind of stuff because you need to be able to charge it. And don't rely on it too heavily. And I did, and it cost me. Yeah, well, thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah, I think I know a lot of people have questions about cell phones and the boundary waters generally too. So I think that's a good, a good point. Yeah, and there. I can address that real quick, and we can get back to those PLBs. But uh, don't plan on having cell phone coverage in the backcountry because you can't guarantee it's going to happen. Um, I, did, uh, I did a hike on uh, Mount Whitney. And uh, yeah, you can't guarantee that you have cell phone coverage. So the, we talked a little bit about the PLBs, uh, personal locator beacons. Uh, they're great as long as they're charged. Uh, PLBs, the most common ones are things like Garmin and InReach Mini, the little one. And then uh, it's a spot. Those are great when they have power and they're great to use in, in terms of emergencies. But you need to have a couple, to, there's a couple criteria that need to be met. First of all, you have to pay for a subscription. And second of all, you have to have clear air. You know, you have to have a, a clear view of the sky. Because remember, these things are GPS. So don't rely too heavily on tech. How's that? Yeah. Looking through the comments and questions, it looks like we have a few different people. Um, Aaron and Ted and a few others asked about if there's a windstorm while you're in your tent at night, what's the best protocol? Should you leave the tent and find somewhere else? Or what, what would be your suggestion there? If there's no lightning or anything of that nature, if you have guide down your tent good enough and you trust it, I, it's okay to stay in it. Um, I, was, uh, I did a through hike of the Superior Hiking Trail in 2017 and I took a hammock with me. And... Uh, I'd slung the hammock and the winds just picked up and they started blowing and, you know, trees were falling all around me. Um, which trees that I thought weren't that close, but, uh, you know, 
you hear it and everything sounds like it's about two feet away from me. Um, I stayed put. Um, I, I ended up fine. Um, I, I think you have to evaluate how sturdy your tent is. And uh, if you've guided down well enough and, 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 and your, your tent is relatively sturdy, then yeah, absolutely go ahead and stay in it. If you're concerned about things like widow makers and things like that, then find a clearing, um, which isn't always which isn't always great to do, especially since you know most of the times you got your tent set up, it's nighttime, and now you have to try to find a clearing. So keep those things in mind. You're going to have to evaluate those things. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have a real clear answer for you, but uh, for the most part, I I, I tend to stay put. Great, thank you, yeah. Um, other questions, somebody is wondering about hypothermia, um, how to avoid it and what to do um, if you do get hypothermia. So it, it, it's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate hypothermia when you're, when you're in the back country. One thing is don't overheat. Uh, don't be afraid to take off layers if you start to feel yourself get warm from activity. Because what hypothermia is essentially is a, a reduction of your core temperature as a result of things, outside influences making you cold. A lot of times what happens is people will start to work and they'll start paddling or they'll start hiking and they start to sweat and then their clothes hang on to that, that moisture for whatever length of time and it starts to sap that body heat away from you. Don't be afraid to throw on that space blanket. You know, that space blanket in your 10 essentials, I carry it with, I carry it in a car because I, I can throw that thing on. It'll reflect some heat. It'll keep me warm. Uh, I never wear cotton. That's one of those things with that, you know, cotton hangs onto that moisture. And through that process of conduction, it pulls that heat away from your body, making you cold. So, you know, those are a couple things you can do to mitigate that. Um, don't be afraid to eat something. If you start to feel yourself feeling a little bit hypothermic, take a bite of an energy bar or something like that because your body will be digesting that. And through that digestion, you'll actually generate body heat to help keep that core temperature where it needs to be. But the, the key is keeping yourself dry. Great. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that eating something is a great tip before you go to bed. Take a bite of something. Um, my body because of your activity level, because what you're doing out there is different than what you do in the city, you tend to have a higher activity level. Your body burns up those calories a lot faster than you can take them in. If I like to eat something before I go to bed, because my body is generating that heat, and it's a really good, it's a really good tip for winter camping as well. Great. Yeah, that's a good point. Um... Distracted by all of these good questions here. Um, is it bad to pitch a tent near the roots of trees? I don't know that's necessarily bad. Uh, I, once again, you need to really pay attention to what's up and around you. I mean, widow makers, and, and that's those dangerous branches that are up in the, you know, that are partially broken that could come down at any minute and, and day some wind. Those, uh, those tend to be a little bit more precarious than others. I tend to not camp, I tend to not set up right under a tree. Uh, you're, you're tempted to because of that little extra layer of protection that it provides. But uh, I tend to not camp too close to trees. I tend to be out more of a clearing area if I can find one. Um, unless you're hammock camping, obviously, then you kind of don't have much of a choice. But uh, even then you can get between two trees and you're not that close. Um, but I, I tend not to camp underneath trees. Which can sometimes be hard in the boundary waters, but absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you know, and, and you need to pick the place that sucks the least. That's really what, that's really what it comes down to. Um, you, you know, I, I showed you that picture with the, with the tent. While that looks like a great place to camp in theory, make sure you look up, down and around. You know, you can tell where water is rushed through on a recent rainstorm because you'll see the branches are moved away and the leaves have moved to the side and you'll see clear dirt. So that gives, it's a real telltale sign that there's water coming through here. 
probably not the best place to set up your tent or, or set up an emergency shelter. So just keep those kinds of things in mind. Great, yeah. Well, it looks like we're getting kind of to the end of our time. So I'll maybe ask one final question and then wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, so the last one, I mean, there's, we got a lot um, in the chat here, but somebody is wondering, is the Boundary Waters patrolled by air and how do you signal and how do you kind of get attention um, if you do need rescue? So I like to, I, once again, I carry that, that light stick if I hear anything. It's not typically patrolled by air unless there's, unless there's a call. Um, I, don't, I, I don't recall hearing anything specific. I, I'm, you, and you can go to the St. Louis County Facebook page and, they, and, and, fr and like it, and you'll get updates on what they're doing out there. But um, I don't recall them just patrolling for the sake of patrolling. Um, another tip, you know, we talked a little bit about PLBs earlier. Some of your outfitters that some of you are going to be using do have these PLBs or SAT phones that you're able to use, that you're able to rent as part of your regular gear. Uh, so know that uh, there's a couple of them out there that you can rent that stuff if you need to, and then you don't have to make the purchase because a spot locator is something like $150 and the inReach Mini is $299. That's a lot of cash to shell out sometimes. So you, so, so you can rent them from some of the outfitters that you're, you're getting your gear from. Great, that's super helpful. Um, yeah, so it looks like we're not gonna be able to um, get to all the questions today. So I'm gonna put my email address in the chat and feel free to um, email me with further questions and I can forward those on. Um, and make sure they get answered. Um, so that's going in the chat now. I also wanted to draw attention um, at Friends of the Boundary Waters. We do have a web page to help um, plan your trip, explore, think about what things you might need to plan. Um, that is in the chat there as well. Um, so I encourage you to check out that site. Um, and I know that um, JR has classes you can sign up for. So feel free to, to get in contact with us too um, if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, wanted to thank you so much, JR, for this great presentation. I took some notes down. I've learned a lot here, and I've seen a lot of people um, have, have great feedback already in the comments. So we really appreciate you being here and all of the work that you're doing. Um, thanks to everybody who joined. I'm really glad you could join us. Um, stay tuned for more webinars that we'll keep doing throughout the spring. And have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks, all. Be safe. Have fun.